James ascended the English throne in 1603. He wasted no time in ordering a new edition of the Bible in order to deny the common people the marginal notes they so valued in the Geneva Bible, or probably to promote his right as a king. Okay. That James I wasn't going to have any marginal notes to annoy him and lead English citizens away from what he wanted them to think is a matter of public record. In an account corrected with his own hand, dated February 10, 1604, he ordained that a translation to be made of the whole Bible as consonant as can be to the original Hebrew and Greek, and this to be set out and printed without any marginal notes, and only to be used in all churches of England in time of divine service. James then set up rules that made it impossible for anyone involved in the project to make an honest translation. Uh-oh. Some of which follow. 1. The ordinary Bible read in the church, commonly called the Bishop's Bible, to be followed and as little altered as the truth of the original will permit. Or, since the common people preferred the Geneva Bible to the existing government publication, let's see if we can slip a superseded government publication onto their bookshelves, altered as little as possible. Now where's two? There's one, there's two, where's, there's three, where's two? Okay. The old ecclesiastical words to be kept is the word church, not to be translated congregation, etc. That is, if a word should be translated a certain way, let's deliberately mistranslate it to make the people think God still belongs to the Anglican church. Excuse me. Six, no marginal notes at all to be affixed, but only for the explanation of the Hebrew or Greek words, which cannot, without some circumlocution, so briefly and fitly be expressed in the text. James didn't want those pesky marginal notes cropping up, not even once. That was fine for the common herd, but not for James's own bishops. Many of their writings and sermons alluded to the Geneva Bible and its marginal notes decades after the King James Bible was published. The bishops had good reason to be confused. They needed those marginal notes. James had just obliterated a procedure that kings and governments had used for thousands of years. Because words and phrases quite often had several meanings, all important state or royal decrees, treatises and agreements contained marginal explanations or commentaries in order to remove all doubt from the mind of the reader. In the 16th century, those marginal notes were called glosses. Today, the members of the legal profession use almost the same system in the form of footnotes and case cites or citations. The King James Bible was finally printed in 1611. It was not technically a translation. What the flunkies employed by King James did was revise and compare other translations of which they simply plagiarized about 20% of the Geneva Bible. Yeah, that's what we read that he... Uh, ordered a new rewrite. He didn't like the uh, Puritan Bible as well, apparently. But it's obviously the Geneva Bible. So he had a rewrite of it. A revised version done by this committee. And he's got a footnote down the bottom here. Translations from one language to another almost never come out word for word, identically. In the New, in the new Testament translation, the King James translators didn't even revise and compare. What they did was simply copy, almost word for word, William Tyndale's 1525 New Testament. At the time of his translation, Tyndale's New Testament had been labelled as seditious material by Henry VIII, and copies discovered on ships reaching English ports were confiscated and destroyed. William Warham, Archbishop of Canterbury, even went so far as to buy all the copies he could get in Europe in order to destroy them. Tyndale was hounded from London to Cologne to Worms. It's uh, in Germany, right? He set tooled in Marburg under the protection of Philip, landgrave of Hesse. Or Hesse. Nobody messed with Big Phil. Philip didn't care what anyone thought. If he felt like telling the Imperator to stuff it, he did. If neighbouring royalty wanted to rumble, Philip showed up with troops. If Philip decided one wife wasn't enough for him, he just took another one. In March of 1540, after Martin Luther and other prominent Protestant theologians had expressly approved polygamy, according to the scriptures, Philip became Europe's best-known bigamist. 
Unfortunately, even Philip couldn't cope with treachery. Tyndale was betrayed by his personal Judas, Henry Phillips. He was tried for heresy, condemned, strangled at the stake, and his body afterwards burnt. Did they supposedly dig up his bones later, we read, and try to burn those as well? <laughs> try to burn him in the afterlife? And then, it is interesting to note that the Geneva reformers, men such as John Calvin, expressed opinions in the marginal notes that would be simply unacceptable to the scholars of today. For example, the passage in Genesis 12, 2-3, that reads, And I will make, and I, God, will make of thee a great nation, and will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Is he talking to Abraham? I will also bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee that shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Our ministers today tell us that this refers to Jews. This isn't the way the Geneva translators understood it. The world shall recover by thy seed, which is Christ, the blessing that the blessings that were lost in Adam. Okay, so is that uh, God talking to Adam that he'd make him a great nation and from them will come many children or descendants or whatever. And they'll be called uh, followers of or descendants of Abraham because they accepted the Christ. Is that what it's referring to? 20th century scholarly works such as the Schofield Reference Bible we've got a copy of that even though it's falling apart published by Oxford University Press holds that the 38th chapter of Ezekiel refers to an invasion of Jerusalem by Russian armies leading the Northern European powers. John Calvin and his cohorts who annotated the Geneva Bible understood it a little differently. It's down here, 7 uh, Genesis 12 2 note compare 1559 Geneva Bible compare it right signifying all the people of the world should assemble themselves against the church and Christ their head the Reverend Schofield and his fellow scholars hold up Satan as some sort of boogeyman the Geneva translators as in Psalm 109.6 simply translated the word adversary in Mark 8.33 Christ said to Peter get thee behind me Satan so he wasn't saying he was the devil right yeah. maybe he's saying one Influenced by Satan. The Geneva translators understood exactly what the word meant and apparently didn't figure anyone else would be dumb enough to equate Peter with the evil one. There you go. On that, the Geneva and King James translate the word the same. James did not stop at censoring the Bible. He carried his divine right of kings. That's what he was all about, right? Plus he didn't like those margin notes. But his main thing to get on the throne was to uh, push that divine right of kings. To the point that he dissolved Parliament. That institution was, to James, simply a convenience he needed to raise money for his endless pursuit of pleasure and depravity. When Parliament balked, balked at his request for money, James dissolved it. Magna Carta and the liberties of an Englishman were more mere frivolities in the mind of James. As an illustration of the loathing and contempt Christians of that era held for the government of James I, it is interesting to note that after the first bitter weather in New England, when half their number were dead, not one of the pilgrim survivors wanted to be taken back to the England of James, one aboard the Mayflower. James' oldest son died and his second son Charles ascended to the throne after the death of James I. Charles also believed in the divine right of kings. By 1642, English patience was at the end and civil war erupted. By 1649, the English Parliament had had enough of Charles, who apparently believed that one of his divine rights was to sign agreements and then break them. In time he felt the urge. Charles was beheaded. Oliver Cromwell took over the government. Oliver Cromwell of Celtic, or Celtic and Welsh ancestry made the same basic mistake that James I and his son, Charles, made. Cromwell believed, as James had professed to, that governments were for the common... Wheel or good and not the common will. It's wheel with W E A L. Uh, is it supposed to be commonwealth? We think it's common wheel. Okay. Not too sure now. And not the common will. Yeah, wheel. W E A L, not will. He tried to legislate moral codes that very few could handle. The prisons overflowed with his critics. During his invasion of Ireland, he slaughtered enough women and children to fill entire graveyards. Cromwell died in uh, 1658. The English had had quite enough of his form of government and acquired another king, Charles II. The last run of Geneva Bibles were, 
was printed in 1644. That was the year John Milton was invited to instruct the English Parliament on the actual teachings of the Bible regarding divorce. It was allowed. What Milton understood that none of our modern experts seem to was that he who divorces his wife and marries another was not a prohibition of divorce. It was a prohibition against throwaway people. Yeah, uh, so what would that mean? You're just divorcing your wife to marry the other one. Your mistress or something like that, right? Or your behind the scenes uh, bit on site. Okay, it was a pro prohibition against throwaway people. It's John Milton and his on Christian doctrine and Martin Luther in his essay on Deuteronomy 21.15 pointed out having more than one wife was scriptural ok was it? is it? you just weren't supposed to throw them away when you got bored with them ok four years after the last Geneva Bible was printed the Thirty Years War the last of the great religious wars of Europe ground to a halt millions had died Germany was so depopulated it took her two centuries to recover. The Reformation had survived. It didn't survive for long. After several generations of English speakers grew up without the stabilizing influence of the Geneva marginal notes, the interpret it any way you want school of thought came into fashion. The charismatic movement was in full swing by 1730. A few men here at India tried to show people what the religion of the ancestors actually was. A man named Farah Fenton published his own translation of the Bible in 1906 complete with a history lesson at the beginning of each set of books in the Bible. Another man named George Lamsar wrote Idioms of the Bible Explained and tried to show the errors of the modern scholars. They were drowned by the works of others. Okay. Yeah, George Lamsar, a native-born Syrian who translated the Syriac Peshitta into English. Okay. Because the original ancient, very old uh, Tab Ashtut uh, Aramaic and the Galilean Aramaic, the Old Testament and New Testament uh, manuscripts have idioms, the expressions of these Eastern scribes, Eastern monks, the Eastern peoples. They have a very different mindset to our Western mindset. And a lot of times in our videos, we uh, might read a chapter, uh, a book, a chapter, and underneath it's got a footnote explaining it. English has idioms as well. Of course, there were those that went the other way. A backwards preacher, Noah Fredericks, wrote a book titled Pilgrim Ships, in which he claimed the people of the Old Testament came from outer space. Moses' rod was an electronic control used to open a fortress, mistranslated rock. Elijah introduced a path for current to flow from the ionosphere to ground in order to fry two platoons of Ahab's infantry and other theological positions that will probably never be taken seriously by anybody, unfortunately. During the 16th century and the one preceding it, the Spanish Empire, a colossus larger than the Roman Empire, had been unable to stamp out the Reformation with the world's finest and most well-equipped armies. The Spaniards needn't have bothered. What the armies of Catholic Spain were unable to make a dent in, one sadistic sodomite, James I, did with a pair of censoring scissors. The Reformation and the blood of millions who fought for it apparently went for nothing. Protestant churches of today hardly resemble the churches of the Reformation. Today's preachers study the Schofield Reference Edition of the King James, a volume that contains marginal notes that would seem no more accurate than to John Calvin and John Knox, their mother goose. The blind are once more leading the blind. This reprinted edition of the 1599 Geneva Bible is probably the last sputtering flame of the Reformation.